that you can return now tonight, and I am so proud to see all of you here, and especially those four guys sitting back there on the back row. They are my favorites. <laughs> and one reason they are my favorites, my nephew works with me. <laughs> So anyway, it's good to see all of you here. And how many of you know what you were doing on 9-11-01? All right. Don't ever forget that day. Because we lost too many people. And it is a bunch that future genealogists will have a hard time tracking them down because there's a stop in the family tree though. And somebody just walked in the door that I would love for y'all to meet. Our new library director as of July 1, 2015, Jonathan Ratchet. for coming out tonight and I really appreciate the help from the many people in this county that helped get the word out. I really appreciate it. We could not do this without you. It is such a privilege to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Joe Dittmar. And I'm going to start off tonight with a photograph that I'm going to pass around. I probably should make two copies of this, but anyway. This is a picture that was taken by Brad Jackson of Oxford and was kindly shared with me by Brad and his wife, Cobb Huggins. This was the scene in New York City at the intersection of Leonard Street and West Broadway on Saturday, September 1st, 2001 at approximately 6.45 p.m. In the background, you can see the beautiful and iconic twin towers of the World Trade Center. No one could have predicted that just 10 days later, its occupants, including our speaker, would experience what could only be described as hell on earth following the terrorist attacks of, two, of September 11, 2001. Few events in our history have been this way. And Mr. Dittmar <coughs> was in the left building that doesn't have the uh, cell tower on it. That's the south tower. Few events in our history have impacted the pursuit of genealogy as dramatically and profoundly as those of September 11, 2001. Countless families were forever altered. According to one statistic from the Raleigh News and Observer, 3,051 children lost a parent on 9-11. Husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, etc. were also lost on that terrible day. Later, widowed spouses remarried and formed new families. Genealogists will be sorting all of this out for many years and generations to come. Mr. Dittmar will present the program, Lessons Learned from a Date with Destiny, an historic and inspirational view of 9-11-2001. His presentation will provide an eyewitness account of the sights and sounds from inside and outside the World Trade Center complex on September 11, 2001. He will also reveal what really happened before, during, and after the terrorist attacks. Dittmar was attending a meeting of 54 insurance executives on the 105th floor of 2 World Trade Center on 9-11. He was one of only seven survivors from that meeting. A Philadelphia, Pennsylvania native, Joe Dittmar has worked in the insurance industry for 35 years. He currently is Director of Property Underwriting for Rock Hill Specialty Programs in Durham, North Carolina. Previously, 
he worked in senior management at Colony Insurance, Lexington Insurance, Alliance Go Global Risk, CNA Insurance Company, and Wausau Liberty Mutual Insurance. Dittmar and his wife live in Chapel Hill and have four children and two grandchildren. He is also a founding member of the Napier Bill 9-11 Memorial Commission. Now, here to share his, ex his extraordinary story is Mr. Joe Dittmar. Martha's just got the natural gift of gab, doesn't she, those who know her? Okay. She was worried about coming up here and talking, and I knew she would do great. It's really a wonderful pleasure to be here with all of you today. And I would especially like to uh, thank Martha Morton for reaching out and asking me to be a part of this session today. Uh, we spoke about five months ago, but Martha's made occasional contact <coughs> to make sure that I was coming and that I didn't forget. And so thank you for your invitation, your persistence, and your graciousness. Until Martha called me, I wasn't really aware of a couple things. As you can tell from my fine southern accent, I'm not from here, okay? <laughs> so the first thing I didn't know was where Granville County was, okay? I didn't realize it was as close as it is to where I live, okay? Uh, I also didn't un uh, understand or realize that Granville County had a genealogical society. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of a group like that, a part that sustains the historical, that they promote the educational, and they seek something that is near and dear to my heart. The ability of those in the now and the future to remember all of those from the past to allow us all to be here today, enjoying the fruits of their labors, the freedoms and the rights for which they so passionately and bravely fought in the past. We can't learn, we can't progress, we can't survive unless we learn and remember the past. But we must apply it in a proactive and positive way to the now and to the future. And that's why the Genealogical Society is so good and that's what it's all about you're a shining example of all of us in this great country try to thrive and survive based on the lessons of the forebears while i'm unsure of my historic american lineage i do know that a part as a part of a historic event from which we can gain much knowledge and many lessons learned and as you have read heard I was on the 105th floor of Two World Trade Center, the South Tower, on September 11, 2001, and was a part of that day in a way I would wish upon no one. Nonetheless, I'm here to present my experiences of that day so we can take advantage of the lessons learned. Martha mentioned that I am a now 36-year veteran of the insurance industry. Um, I actually went to Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, when I graduated from college, I didn't have any intention of getting in the insurance industry. I'm going to age myself by talking about what I was going to do. When I graduated, I was hoping to become a disco DJ. That's what I wanted to do. <laughs> that was my future. But my dad was in the insurance business, and his dad was in the insurance business, and his dad was in the insurance business, so I really didn't stand a chance, okay? But it was a great decision made 36 years ago on my part to get into the business. It's done well by me. If you know anything about the World Trade Centers, one of the things that you would know and realize is that the trade centers were like a mecca for the insurance industry. Virtually every insurance organization in the country, maybe throughout the world, had offices there at the trade center. So it wasn't unusual for a guy in an executive position like mine to be called to go to a meeting there. Um, in August of 2001, Mary Weeman, an extremely powerful woman from the Aon Corporation, a woman who had smashed through the glass ceilings of what still tends to exist sometimes in the insurance industry, Mary called me in August and she asked me to come to New York 
I was working in Chicago at the time. She asked me to come to New York the following month to attend a meeting at the Trade Center. Um, I didn't want to go to the meeting that Mary was inviting me to. I had a chance to go to another type of insurance meeting around the same time. The type of meeting that involves aluminum or titanium sticks about this long little metal head in the end, little white balls in the grass. <laughs> that was the meeting or the type of meeting that I wanted to attend at that same time. But Mary, on that phone call, did to me what every woman has been doing to me since the day I was born. She threw good old-fashioned Catholic guilt down on my head. Sure, Joe, absolutely no problem. You don't have to attend the meeting. I mean, nobody from your company will be there. I'm sure your boss won't mind. I'm sure it won't be a big deal to him that nobody from your company will be there. So, Mary, stop. 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 I'll be there. I'll be there. My dad um, was my mentor in the business, my hero in life, taught me a lot of great things. And one of the things that he taught me is something or an adage that probably each and every one of you have heard and maybe still use to this day. Plan your work, work your plan. Okay? And I remembered that very strongly, particularly at that point when Mary was badgering me to go to the meeting because I thought, you know what? I can do this. I can go to New York. I can go to that meeting that she wants me to go to. The other meeting is in the same area, so I can probably go to that meeting. I come from that area, so uh, this will work, okay? So on the Friday before the Tuesday, I went back to Philadelphia, the city that I was born and raised in, and I visited my mom and dad. They were living in the house that I grew up in at that time in northeast Philadelphia. And on Saturday, I had the chance to visit my sister, something that I still don't do enough to this day and age. On Sunday, I went to the Philadelphia Eagles-St. Louis Rams football game. I, I always chuckle about this because I still have my seats to the Philadelphia Eagles. I'm a season ticket holder. My son's 34. I pay for the seats. He sits in the seats. What a great deal for him. The bank of dad never closes, okay? <laughs> Um, but uh, I had the chance to go with him on that Sunday to the game with him. And it's interesting. My son is about the same height as me, but he's in great physical shape. He is what, in essence, I would call uh, uh, basically a, a roughneck. He is a guy who works for Valero Oil. And when there's an explosion out on the pipes, he's one of the first guys to go out and figure out what's wrong, how to fix it, it stop, turn the gas off, do whatever, okay? Dangerous job, just like the job that these guys in the back have. Guy. It's a dangerous, dangerous job. But he, because, even though he's a little guy and whatnot, he thinks because he does that job that he's macho. He's tough, okay? So it was really interesting. We came out of the game that day, and we're walking across the parking lot. And we're about halfway through the parking lot. He gives me this big, giant hug. He kind of whispers in my ear, I miss you, Dad. And I push back and look at see a little tear in his eye. And I knew he wasn't crying because of the game. The Eagles beat the Rams. Everybody beats the Rams, okay? Yeah. I, I guess it was a pretense of what was about to occur, and I just didn't know where it hit. And he got in his truck. I got my car. Off I went to South Jersey to the beautiful Marriott Resort Seaview Country Club. Uh, woke up on Monday morning, had that meeting, had lunch that day, had a real business meeting in the afternoon, and then we're, we were going to sit down for dinner on Monday night. Insurance dinners are kind of notorious because they tend to begin but never end, okay? They just go on and on forever and ever, everybody laughing and drinking and having a good time. And I had told the <coughs> women and gentlemen that I was attending that dinner with that night, listen, I got a plan. I can't stay up all night because I got to get up early tomorrow morning. That was my plan. If you've ever been to New York, if you come from New York, if you know anything about New York, the one thing you know that you don't want to have to do is drive into New York. Okay? It's pretty bad, right? So I thought, you know what? I'm going to have a plan, and my plan was a good one. I said, I'm going to get up early in the morning from South Jersey, I'm going to drive back to Philadelphia, park in the parking lot of 30th Street train station, Amtrak, take the Metro Liner to New York City. That's what I was going to do. So I got up at 3.30 in the morning on Tuesday, and I drove back to Philadelphia, got there about 5.30. Bought my round-trip ticket to New York City. Um, 
train pulled in at about 6 a.m., ran down the steps, took off my suit coat, took off my backpack. I don't carry a briefcase, I carry a backpack. Took out my laptop, turned it on, sat down, got in the train, settled in, and did what all of us insurance executives do at 6 a.m. in the morning on the Metroliner train to New York City with our laptops on on our laps. I fell asleep. It was 6 o'clock in the morning. I was tired. And off we went. And we were about two-thirds of the way up when my cell phone rang. Cell phones. I always tell people, you know, it's amazing. When they rewrite the history books within the next 10 to 25 years, cell phones will then be in there as one of the greatest inventions ever made. It has changed the way we live our lives. There are people in this room that don't remember life before cell phones. That's incredible. I mean, that's incredible. For those of us that do remember back in the day, and there are a few of us that remember back in the day, okay? For those of us that remember back in the day, when you were going on a business trip like the one I was going on, you had to have a plan, okay? You had an itinerary. It was written on a piece of paper. It told you where you were going to be, where you were going to go, when the meetings were, where the meetings were going to be, what hotel you were staying at. Okay? You took your AT&T long distance card because God forbid you had to pay for the long distance calls. Okay? You had a plan. And it, everybody knew what that plan was. But with cell phones, you don't need to do that anymore. Wherever you are, that's where you'll be. Just hit me up on a cell phone. It's no big deal. Just call me. So before this trip, I had said to my wife, hey, I'm going back to Philadelphia, seeing the family, going to the game with Joe. Got a meeting in New York on Tuesday. I'll be home Tuesday night. Love you. That's all I told her. So, I thought I forgot. I remember where I was. I was on the train. I was fast asleep. We're about two-thirds of the way up to New York City. And my cell phone rings. And I answered, hello, it was my wife. And she said, oh my God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wake you up. And I said, no, 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 that's okay. He said, the train's about to pull into Newark. And i got to get off. New York. I thought you said you were going to New York. And I said, yeah, I am. I said, but it's a lot easier to get to the World Trade Center if you take the PATH train from Newark right into New York City because it stops right underneath the Trade Center. So that day, I told my wife exactly where I was going to be. And I dutifully got off the Amtrak train with thousands of other New Jerseys <coughs> and made my way into New York City. And when we got into the Trade Center, the South Hill, Two World Trade Center, it was kind of interesting. The people that were in charge of security in those buildings were incredible. They knew how to handle people and how to handle the security of the buildings. And I think the 1993 bombing made that a reality for those folks, okay? But they just seemed to have this knack of being able to know who did and who didn't belong in the building just by looking at you. No identification, just by looking at you. Um, do you know that there were as many as 25,000 people in each of those buildings at any point in time? Each of those buildings had their own zip code. That's how big of a community this was, okay? It's unbelievable, okay? So these guys were great. They seemed to know. I walked in. I honest to God didn't have a big shirt on that said Philadelphia or anything like that. I mean, this guy knew I didn't belong. He kind of waved over to me. And I did what I was supposed to do. Went over to his desk and identified myself with my driver's <coughs> license. He took my picture electronically. He transferred that picture onto a little plastic card. And on that card, besides the picture, was my name the name of the company that I was going to visit, Aon Corporation, the floor that I was going to, the 105th floor, and how long the card was for. It was good until September 12, 2001, and a barcode. And the barcode was the most important thing on that card. Not just because it contained all that other information I just mentioned electronically, but also because that was the way you would swipe your way through the electronic turnstiles that separated you from the elevators in the building. Both buildings were identical. Both buildings were 110 stories high. The 110th floor in the North Tower was the Windows of the World restaurant. 
and unfortunately it was open that morning. The 110th and the 106th floors in the South Tower, the building that I was in, they were observation decks. And thank goodness it was too early in the morning for them to be open. The other floors that I did not mention above 105 in each of those buildings, <coughs> heating, ventilation, air conditioning, elevator equipment, cabling, so on and so forth, no human beings. We were about to swipe our way electronically through the electronic turnstile <coughs> to go to the 105th floor in the South Tower, the highest occupied level of the building at that time. When you got through those uh, turnstiles, you had a choice. To the right, a bank of elevators that serviced all the floors between that lobby and the 77th floor. To the left, a bank of bigger elevators that could hold more people that went on an express basis from that lobby to the 78th floor sky lobby level. Building. And that's exactly what it was. It was a second lobby in the building. You'd go up to 78, and then you'd get on another set of elevators that would service everything from 79 all the way up through 110. We did exactly that. We got up to the uh, 78 floor, switched over, got onto the elevators, up to 105. And when the doors at 105 opened up, there was Mary Weeman, the woman that had shamed me to attend this meeting, okay? And it was kind of a surreal moment because in one hand, she's got a spray bottle of Murphy's oil soap, and in the other hand, she's got a rag. Now, Mary wasn't Susan the homemaker by any stretch of the imagination, okay? But this was how important this meeting was to her. She wanted everything perfect right down to the furniture inside the enclosed conference room that she was about to take us to. That conference room was, wow, almost identical to the size of the room we're in here today, okay? But different from this because it was an enclosed conference room. Four walls, no windows, one set of doors. The meeting was supposed to commence at 8.30. I've been in the insurance business for 36 years. There's never been an insurance meeting that's ever started on time. This day was no different. 8.30 kind of came and went, everybody drinking their Starbucks, talking about kids playing soccer, doing whatever, okay? And at about 8.48, the lights flicked. That's it, just a flicker of lights. We couldn't see anything. We didn't hear anything. We didn't feel anything. Just a flicker of lights. Almost immediately, a guy by the name of Rick Blood from the Aon Corporation came bounding into the room and he said, hey, there's been an explosion in the North Tower and we've got to evacuate. 54 intelligent human beings all in the same room, all at the same time, and we all did the same exact thing. We're fine. We're fine. It's New York. Stuff happens. Wasn't exactly the word we used. Stuff happens. <laughs> We're going to have our meeting. Meet, you know, let us go. We're going to be fine. And he looked at us and he had kind of a, a lost look in his eye. And he said, no, 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 you don't, you don't understand. He said, I am a volunteer fire marshal for the 105th, 104th, and the 103rd floors. I can't leave until everybody leaves. And I want to leave. And I know that Rick got everybody out of that room that day. Because I was the last guy out. He proceeded to escort us all to the nearest fire stairwell inside the building, closest to where we were. And that's where he told us that we were now going to walk down 105 flights of steps. Oh yeah, what a bunch of happy cameras, okay? <laughs> and you know, you could just see everybody was annoyed. They all did the same thing. Every one of us did the same thing. Went into our pockets, to our left or our right, to our holsters, wherever, and we pulled out our cell phone. We were going to call somebody to moan and groan about the fact that we couldn't have our meeting. And something interesting really happened on the way to the cell phone. This was back in the day when everybody had a flip phone. If you still have a flip phone, shame on you, okay? But, <laughs> but anyhow, this was back in the day when everybody had them, right? You'd flip them in, they turn them, boom, and they'd go on. Everybody was doing that. Something really interesting was going on. No service. No service. No service. You saw the picture that Martha passed around, and you would realize that the North Tower, the first building that was struck, 
how the main cell tower for all of southern Manhattan cell service virtually interrupted. And for those of you old enough to understand this, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, get on a landline. Okay? Somebody will explain landline to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> get on a landline, you'll be fine. You know, you can call whoever you need to call. And that's really a smart thing to think about, except think about this. Everybody that's in New York is now on those landlines trying to call their mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, whomever, to let them know that they're okay. Even more incredible, but very believable, this is no stretch. Everybody in the world that knows somebody in New York City, everybody in the world is now calling in on those landlines to find out whether their mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle are okay. Landlines were overmatched, couldn't handle all the traffic. Cell service, virtually interrupted. You've had the great privilege of serving this country in the armed services. You know what you do when you attack the enemy? First thing you do, like the lines of communications. And that's exactly what happened. So now you've got this 54 group of type A personalities all standing at the uh, stairwell 105, and their cell phones don't work, and they can't communicate. So now they're doubly perturbed, okay? Another word that I didn't use, but okay. Everybody's a, lo a little bit nicked about this whole thing. And I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, didn't you know what was going on? And that's exactly the point, folks. Each and every one of you knew way more what was happening inside and outside those buildings than any of us that were right there. We had no clue. Not a clue. We started to make our way down those stairwells. In a high-rise building, the fire stairwell doors work pretty much the same way. Okay? If they are open, which they're not always supposed to be, but if they are open, they're all open and held open on a magnet-type basis. If there's an emergency, the magnets release, the doors close, they don't lock, but they close, okay? And inside those fire stairwells, to the right or to the left of the door at each level, especially at the higher levels, or if not on the back of the door, there's a sign, and the sign says something to the effect of, once you're in here, don't leave, except at the lobby. Now, I know those signs exist because it's a fire safety, that's a life safety thing, some insurance geek like me is responsible for that, okay? So we're coming down from 105, and we got down to the 90th floor, and that fire stairwell door on 90 is propped up. Propped up. Everybody's filing out from the fire stairwell to the 90th floor. But I'm in the fire insurance business. How ironic is that? I am in the fire insurance business, and I know better, right? Let me ask you a question. How many of you here have or have had children between the ages of 13 and 18? Just a little show again. Right? Yeah, right. Okay. And when they were between 13 and 18, and you told them that they were absolutely, positively not going to do whatever it was, what did they do? Amen. Okay. Well, you can be 45 and be just as not so smart sometimes. I followed everybody out of that fire stairwell and walked onto the 90th floor, and i got to tell you, that's where I experienced the worst 30, 40 seconds of my life. To look out those windows to the north, to see these gaping black holes in the sides of that building. Gray and black billows of smoke pouring out of those holes. Flames redder than any red I had ever seen before, licking up the side of the building and beyond the roof level. And if you remember, it was a crystal clear September day that day in New York City. And I remember looking out and being able to see through that smoke, through that fire, into those huge black holes, and seeing the fuselage of a large plane lodged inside the building. And my first immediate thought was, my God, how could the pilot have missed that building? And the fact of the matter was, he didn't miss. He didn't miss. And to see all that, and to see furniture, paper, people being pulled, out of the building against their will. It was an incredible, awesome, gruesome sight. I was so, so afraid. I'm looking at this thing and 
I knew it wasn't a made-for-TV movie. I knew it wasn't an Xbox game. This was reality. I just didn't want to be there. I wanted to leave. Two honest feelings took over my being almost immediately. The very first one that came into my heart right away had to do with me remembering a Friday afternoon in boys' religion at St. Anselm School when I was in the eighth grade, and Sister Joseph Regina was teaching us this religion, and she was, it was the Friday before a New York Giants Philadelphia Eagles football weekend. Big deal in Philly, big rivalry, okay? And I remember Sister talking to us and saying to us, boys, you gotta remember, you gotta love God. You gotta love your neighbor. But I think it's okay to hate New York. I remember her saying that, and I remember how much I hated New York at that very, very second, and I thought, oh my God. But another being, a feeling to go over my being a much more honest one, and one that each and every one of you have had. Yes, gentlemen, even you have had this, whether it was yesterday, a year ago, a decade ago, a minute ago, that pit of your stomach, I want my mommy. I just wanted to go home. I didn't want to be there. I just wanted to go home. And I turned to leave, and Lud Pacero was right behind me. Lud was with the Zurich Insurance Company. He was this huge human being. He was a middle linebacker, all-American middle linebacker at University of Pittsburgh when he was a kid. And I almost knocked him over with my stubby little body because I was in such a hurry. And he put his big, giant hands on my shoulders. He said, what are you going to do, man? And I said, I'm getting out of here. What are you going to do? He said, you know what? I'm doing the same thing. But before I go, uh, I'm going to go to the restaurant. That simple decision to use a men's room cost a lot of his life. That simple decision. I got back to the top of the fire stairwell, and there was an announcement blaring out over the PA system in the building. Some of you may have read or heard about it. And the announcement went something to the effect of the event has been contained to the North Tower. We believe that the South Tower is considered safe. We suggest that if you work in the South Tower, you return to your workstation. If you are a visitor, we suggest that you stay where you are until further notice. And if you feel you need to leave, please proceed. Thank you. You haven't let me down. I've been doing this for 13 plus years. Everybody reacts the same exact way. The groans, I can't believe they're saying it. I even got the fire guys in the back up. You're crazy, right? But think about this. There's a woman or man in charge of building security. And they're down at the lobby level of this building. They know that there may be as many as 25,000 people in the building. Okay? Outside, it's raining concrete, steel, and bodies. At this point, there's a cop on one side of that person, a firefighter on the other side of that person, looking at this person saying, well, where in the heck are you going to put it? I'm sure this person thought to themselves, well, wait a minute. The elevators are going up and down. The air conditioning, ventilation system's working. Electricity's on. Everything's good. Hold on. Let's just wait and see what's going on. Let's just wait. Who would have thought that within 18 minutes, the same exact then it would happen again. Who would have thought? Now, for my part, I was proceeding. I didn't know how cautious I was going to be. And you can't run down switchback steps. You just can't. The momentum will just take you into a wall at the end of each set of steps, okay? So you kind of get the skip thing going. And we got down to the 78th floor, that sky lobby level that I had mentioned before. And there's Mary Weenie the woman I've mentioned several times. And she's looking back at me. And she's looking at me and she's screaming, Joey, Joey, Joey. The only other people in the world that call me Joey are my old Polish aunts. Okay, Joey, Joey, I am not walking down 78 flights of steps in these shoes. I'm taking the elevator. She was using a word you never use here in the middle. But that's Mary. Powerful, leader, strong. And I see Al Capin from Liberty International Insurance Company. This guy's a volunteer firefighter, captain of his company, I don't know. 
following the narrative to the elevator. Dave Carlin, Senior Vice President of Factory Mutual Insurance Company, the best, the finest fire insurance company in all the world. Following Mary to the elevator. Finally, common sense took over in my brain, and I thought to myself, you know, building, stay in the rest, don't get in an elevator, stay in the steps. Yeah, I know it's not my building. Ah. And I looked at her and kind of waved, turned, and went back to the stairway. Arguably the best decision I've made in what is still my life. Because I was somewhere between the 74th and the 72nd floor when the second plane plowed through our building. That plane went through our building on an angle between floors 78 and 82. We were just a few short floors below the strike zone. It was incredible. And I have never felt anything like that before in my entire life. That fire stairwell that we were inside, this concrete bunker that we were inside, basically started to shake from side to side. I am not an engineer, I can't tell you angles, but it shaked from side to side. The concrete splattering out, the handrails breaking away from the wall, the fire retardant material coming down on us like snow from the ceiling level, the steps undulating underneath our feet like waves in the ocean. We feel this heat wall blowing by us. We smell this jet fuel, and this thing is just rocking back and forth, back, forth, back, forth. And finally, it settles. And you would think that there would be this massive pandemonium. And yet, in that fire stairwell, after that settlement, there was nothing but a stunned, stunned sign. I had the good fortune of working with people from the USA Today and um, ABC News just prior to the first anniversary of the event. And I learned something in my visit with them at that time that I always mention at this point of the presentation. Just the heat generated by the friction of the plane through the building. No explosion, no fire. Just the heat generated by the friction of the steel through the steel was over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. All those people on the 78th floor waiting to get onto the big elevators were killed instantly. They literally didn't know what hit them. And for them, it was a blessing because for them, there was no pain. For those of us that were by, it became kind of an anxious moment. We really didn't understand what was going on. We were all playing the conjecture game. Well, we saw a plane in the other building. Maybe a fuel cell exploded. That's what shook our building. That's why we smelt that jet fuel, felt that heat ball blowing by. We didn't know. We didn't understand. And we all tried to get on our phones again to try to call and see what was going on. And the cell phones didn't work. And actually, that was good news at that particular point because... <coughs> That was one of those few times where ignorance was bliss. What you didn't know, you couldn't hurt you. So all we had to concentrate was on getting out. And I did see something almost immediately that most of us don't get the chance to see as often as we would like. But you usually do see it in a great state of an emergency. Human nature at its finest. It's amazing when you have to really do something important people do come through. Some of you here are probably or have been teachers, right? And you live by that old adage of 95% of the problems are caused by 5% of the kids, right? That's true in life too. Human beings are good. Human beings are good. We just at our heart and soul will do good. And we saw people right at that very moment begin to help other people in need. There were people that were overweight. There were people on crutches, there were people that were coming into there on wheelchairs, there were people that were just totally afraid. And human beings, just like you and me, just like you and me, started to help these folks to the best of our ability. Help them down the street, try to coach, try to coax them down. Some of the observations on the way down that fire stairwell were kind of common. I mean, at one place, in one time, I have never seen so many pairs 
of women's shoes. Now you think about it, you're 70 flights of steps above ground, you're in three or four inch heels like they say in New York, forget about it. A lot of barefooted women that day. If you wanted a new laptop computer, that was your day. There was more electronic equipment ditched in the side of that fire stairwell than in a bankrupt Circuit City store. There were backpacks, overcoats, briefcases, bags of food, you name it, stuff just ditched to the side so that you could lighten your load. And everybody was heading in the same direction, so egress was pretty good. Two, three, in some places, four people walked, okay? Everybody moving along, everybody going in the same direction. Until the 35th. And that's the chance we had for the first time to encounter the police, firefighters, and the paramedics from New York City and the Port Authority. Just the looks in their eyes told the story. Just the looks in their eyes. They knew. They knew that they were going up those steps to try to fight a fire that they couldn't beat. They knew they were going up those steps to try to save lives that they couldn't save. They knew that they were marching into the balance of hell. And they knew that they were going up and they knew that they were never, <coughs> never coming Be that brave? Could you be that strong? Right at that same time, but there, were, there was a guy who was walking along with us, clearly a maintenance guy from the building. Um, brown shirt, blue yoke, name tag over the pocket, name I never got. And he was carrying along with him the entire time. One of the most annoying inventions God ever allowed us to create the next telephone with the walkie-talkie feature, okay? And this thing had been incredibly quiet the entire walk down. And all of a sudden, you see the cops, the firefighters, the paramedics approaching us. And this thing starts to belch and beep and make all kinds of electronic noise. And we hear this voice scream out, we're on 82, we don't know what we're going to do, we, we can't get down, we don't know what we're going to do. And this guy, he's right to my left, he stops turns on the balls of his feet to go back up the steps. He, I looked at him and I said, what are you going to do, man? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I don't know. But I'm going to save my friend. I submit to you, that nameless maintenance man, that is a true American hero. That man who was willing to lay down his life to save that of a friend. He's someone that should always be remembered. I just can only hope the cops and the firefighters turned that guy around that day and made him leave the building. When we got down to about the 18th floor, we came in contact with the next person that really stuck in my memory. And he was on the 15th floor. But we heard him on the 18th floor because he had a bullhorn, an electronic megaphone, okay? And this guy, he was a security guy from the building. And he was singing through this thing at the top of his lungs in a voice that only a mother could love on payday. I mean, this guy was William Hong revisited, okay? It was just so horrible. And he's singing, God bless America, and he doesn't even know all the words. But every once in a while, he'd stop his singing and he'd yell out, this is a day you're never going to forget. You'll always remember where you were on September 11th. This is a day that's going to go down in history. You, you, you all know the story of the Titanic, right? Okay? And when the boat hit the iceberg, the captain sees the musicians, tells the musicians, go up on the deck, play music, keep them calm, get them off the boat. I'm sure that's exactly what happened with this guy that day. I'm sure his superior said to him, listen, get up to the 15th, keep them relaxed, make them laugh. You had to know with all this bad singing, he was making everybody giggle. 
and get him out of the building. And I wonder how many lives that man saved that day while giving up his own. I wonder. We got down to the lobby level. The lobby had arching glass windows that made you feel like you could see forever. Okay, And you look to your left and you look to your right. This lobby is eerily empty. And you look out those windows and you see the twisted steel and the crumbled concrete and the red blotches on the ground and you, you knew what those red blotches were. So they couldn't let us out at the street level at that particular point in time. And they took us in escorted us down into the concourse level, the underground. And that's the first chance we had to see people who were in real need. People with gaping wounds, missing limbs, true blood and gut stuff. And your human nature makes you want to reach out and try to help people, no matter what, no matter how grotesque it may seem. And you couldn't that day. I've never seen so many firefighters and police there to help people. I've never seen such an outpouring of caring, of concern, love. And that's what that was that day. There was this total outpouring of love. So the people that needed help were getting the help they needed. And those of us that were okay, we were on our own. And the herd mentality takes over. And you hope somebody at the front of your herd knows where they're going. You're now into this rat maze of a concourse with every store known to mankind down there. A big giant path train station to the left all these corridors of stores to the right, and signs that mean absolutely nothing to you if you're not from New York City. One, two, three, four, red, blue, green, yellow, one, you know, uptown, downtown, Bronx, Manhattan. No clue, okay? And you're walking through, and I hear this guy at the front of our little herd, and he goes, hey, you wanna get to the northeastern end of this complex, it's the furthest away from the two buildings. Boom, my internal GPS said, you know what, he's right. I'm following him. And off we went, winding our way through. We're about ready to make our last left through this rat maze up to that northeastern end of the complex. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, Starbucks. And it is open. <laughs> and there are people in line. I kid you not, OK? I am a card-carrying member of the Starbucks nation, OK? But I don't know how much double, triple, crappuccino, whatever it is people drink. <laughs> you know, you just. You just know that sometimes in even the greatest moments of crisis, the right minds aren't in the right place. We got up to the northeastern end of that complex. The escalator is no longer escalating, okay? And we're walking up them. And I hear, Joe, Joe, Joe. I turn around, and it's David Duffy. David Duffy, smartest human being I know. David Duffy is my treaty reinsurance broker. Okay, blank stick. Treaty reinsurance broker. Right? If you think your insurance company, whether it's for your car or your home or your business or whatever, okay, if you think your insurance company actually takes all the bet, you would be wrong. They back themselves up through and with what is called a reinsurance treaty. Okay? David is my reinsurance treaty broker. David is my professional bookie. That's basically what this man is, okay? But he's one of the smartest guys I know, okay? And he's behind me, and I turned around, and I said, Duffy, why are you here? And then I go, oh, that's right, you work here on 54. Why are you behind me? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, why are you behind me? I was on 105, you work on 54. Why are you behind me? You don't want to know, you don't want to know. I said, yeah, I want to know, man. He said, well, he said, I was halfway down. He said, it was about like 25 points down. And I realized we might not get in the office. And I'm in charge of the Yankees tickets for the office. The smartest human being I know went back up 25 flights of steps to get the Yankees tickets. I could have understood if they were Tar Heels tickets, but Yankees tickets, okay? Wow. But there was a reason for this. We went out of the building together. There are bobcat bulldozing back everything, and I mean everything. It is one unbelievable sight. Every uniform known to mankind out there screaming at us, run, 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 don't stop, don't stop. And you get across the street in front of Trinity Church, and you have your Sodom and Gomorrah moment, and you stop, and you turn, and you look back at these two pillars of unbelievability, this ticker tape of 
concrete, steel, and glass. And we're looking at this, and Duffy said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, man. I was supposed to get back on a train, go back to Philly, get in a rental car, drive to the Philly airport, fly <coughs> I don't think that's going to happen. And he said, you know what? I don't think so either. He said, listen, my wife works in the North Tower, 40th floor. I haven't been able to get in contact with her. I want to get home. You come with me. I said, where do you live, man? He said, 117th Street, Upper West Side. I said, wow, that's a long way. He said, you got something better to do? <laughs> okay, good point. And off we went. And we were eight blocks north of the building. Eight minutes. They were short blocks south, north, north, south in that southern section of Manhattan area. And we come across a commercial laundry. The doors are thrown wide open. W-I-N-S, the all-news radio station, blaring out on their radio. But this was an on-purpose terrorist attack. And our jaws just dropped to the ground. Said, this, this can't happen here. This can't happen here. But right at that time, we heard the sounds that are the sounds that, for a lot of us that were there, are what we hear first thing in the morning and last thing in the night. First, the unmistakable sound twisting steel on the crumbling concrete of what once was the South Tower. The building that we had just been in eight minutes prior coming to the ground. And even more incredibly, even more hauntingly, gruesomely, the sound of millions of people on the streets of New York all screaming the same blood curdling scream all at the same time. We were fortunate Duffy had a friend of his that lived in the Tribeca section of the city where we were. And we were able to get into Meredith's flat and we started to do what all of you were doing. We started to watch the TV, to try to make some sense of what was going on. We tried to get out and try to communicate. It was virtually impossible to communicate with anybody in any way, shape, or form. And we were about a fifth hour into our watch inside Meredith's place, watching the TV, when one of the true American heroes of that day, no matter what your politics are, one of the great American heroes of that day, Mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, got on TV and he started to talk. And I got to tell you, it felt like he was talking to each and every one of us. And he looked out and he said, you know, New York, this has been a tough day. We are going to get through this. We are going to survive. We are going to recover. And I know all of you just want to get home. You remember those pictures, folks? You remember people walking over the George Washington Bridge to get to New Jersey, walking out the Long Island Expressway to get home, walking out the Long Island Railroad tracks to get home. And he said that. He said, I know all of you just want to get home. And I believe we have mustered enough confidence in our uniforms. And we are going to reopen the subways. Reopen the subways. Duffy didn't even wait a second. He said, come on, we're going. I said, where? He said, we're going to the subway, man. i got to get home. You can come with me. I said, I don't know. Midtown. Empire State Building. We, we didn't know. We didn't know what the next thing was going to be, right? But he was convincing, and off we went. We walked a couple blocks over, walked down to the sub closest subway station. We were in a crowded subway station. Maybe not the smartest thing on that day, huh? Uh, but we were in this crowded subway station, and the second train that pulled in, we were able to get on. We went up only two stops on an express basis. 30 seconds. Penn Station. Amtrak. The way that I had come in that morning. And the way that I wanted to get out. Even if it was just back to Philly. I just wanted to get out. He knew that. He looked at me. I looked at him. We didn't say a word to each other. We walked into the Penn Station there, and we looked like two tourists not really knowing where we're going. And there's this woman from Amtrak in her finest New York accent. And she looks at me and she says, where are you going, honey? And I said, i got to get to Philadelphia. And she says, great, there's a train down here just about to take off. And I reached inside my coat pocket to give her my return ticket. And she looked at me and she said, are you kidding me, sweetie? We're not collecting tickets today. <laughs> Some things never change in New York, okay? <laughs> And I went down those steps and I got on that train. And you get on that train and you go underneath the Hudson River in a tunnel. And you come up on the Jersey side and you look back at what once was the greatest skyline in all the world, now relegated to a gray and black cloud. How sad. 
that train was filled with people sitting and standing. 80 minutes from New York City to 30th Street in Philadelphia. Not a word was spoken. A word. What were the words to say? When we got down to 30th Street, I got out of the train, found my rental car, decided to go up to my mom and dad's house. And when I got to the house, my mom, my mom was waiting for me. I gotta tell you something. No matter what they're saying, no matter how old or how young, especially to you guys, love your mothers. Love your mothers. Because there's my mom. She comes off the stoop and she gives me this big, giant bear hug and pats my whole day. Sobs in my ear, my baby. Baby. I didn't have the heart to remind her that I was the oldest one. <laughs> <laughs> but my mom did for me at that moment what she's been doing for me all her life, even to this day. She helped me. And she loved me. And that's what I needed right then, was my mom's love. And she helped me into the house, into the living room floor. Uh, started to watch TV, passed out, I don't know, mental exhaustion, physical, physical fatigue, whatever. And, and about two in the morning, I feel this kick in my side. Rub my side, push my glasses back. Look up, open my eyes. My father's hovering over me. And he says, well, aren't you ever going to go to bed? I went, oh, my God, I'm 17 again. <laughs> <laughs> but I did what he told me. I went upstairs, got a couple hours of sleep. Woke up early the next morning. Called the office to let him know that I wasn't going to be in. And it was a good thing. Because they thought I was dead. And I had that rental car. And I lived in Aurora, Illinois, just west of Chicago. And I was going home. And uh, if any of you in here are cops or no cops, I'm going to apologize now. Because I made the 14-hour trip in 11 and a half hours. I just wanted to get home. I just wanted to get home. And this was before national plans on your cell phones and rollover minutes and all the stuff that we have now, OK? I didn't care. I wanted to reach out and touch somebody and be touched by somebody, OK? And I, I know I went over my minutes that day calling everybody. It was good to hear people. It was good to be heard. And I was about five, 10 minutes away from home. And I called my wife for probably what was the 50th time at that point. And I said, hey, I'm almost there. Five, 10 minutes away. And she went, um, OK. I said, something else going on? And she said, well, actually, they're having a mass at Our Lady of Mercy Church. And I thought, that, I said, stop. She said, what? I said, it's a good day to go to church. I'll meet you there. And I pulled down the old road. And I went to go pull into the parking lot of the church. And you would have thought it was Christmas. No room at the end. Okay? And I had to park illegally on the street. So once again, I'm sorry. And I don't know whether I was more afraid the day before or the moment then when I opened up the back doors of that church. And you'd stare in and see these hundreds of pairs of eyes all staring back at me, knowing where I had been. And I looked over to the right, to the pew where we always sit. We're Roman Catholics. We always sit in the same pew. Okay? And there is my wife, a couple of my kids, a couple of my friends. My wife loves to talk. But she's not a demonstrative person. She would never do what I'm doing here tonight. So it was incredible to look over and to see that woman jump over the back of the pew. <laughs> run to the back of the church and give me the greatest hug and a kiss that a man could have won. And I knew at that moment that I was home. I was home. And so that is how this story goes. The lessons in this story are varied and many and all have pertinence 
not just in what we do, but what we are as Americans and as citizens of the world. In the first lesson, there are no guarantees. 3,000 innocent souls showed up for work that beautiful September morning, leaving behind spouses, children, partners, and friends. And for some, the simple decision to show up for work meant that they never got the chance to say goodbye or I love you to those friends, family, children. Don't take anything for granted, ever. And don't put off expressing your love for those you care for, because they need and you need to hear it and say it every day. Amen. We are not invulnerable. In the most violent way, we found out as Americans that there's no magic wall in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean that keeps us any more protected from the forces of evil than any other citizens of the world. It's not safe, it's not wise to assume any level of impenetrability. But we also must not live in fear. Rather, we need to recognize those who try to hurt us, and we need to be aware of their causes and their actions, and we need to pre-act, not react accordingly. Yeah, we need to be on guard, but we need to be who we are and want to be, freedom and liberty-loving citizens world. The most important lesson, yep, it's coming because I know you know it, don't sweat the small stuff. We are all typical Americans and humans and we can all tend to overstate or overreact to things daily. Yet, in the big scheme of things, all that counts at the end of the day is the love of those who count the most. So if you go back home tonight, you go to watch the NBA Finals and you're cable isn't working quite right. That never happens, right? Or if you show up for work tomorrow and the boss got a little bit of a tone to her or him, okay? Or if you get home and you got that 17-year-old and the pair of jeans that you told him to move 15 days ago is still sitting in the same spot. That never happens, right? Keep it all in perspective. Get out in the air. Get out in the sunshine every day. Genuinely greet others you know and work with. As a practice, clear your mind for a few minutes of the minutiae. Try not to clog your heart and your mind and your soul with things that really don't matter. Because in the end, it's you, those you love, and the big boss, whoever that is for you, that counts the most. So don't get boxed up by things that don't matter a lot. You know, just being here is a blessing. And because there is no guarantee of tomorrow, you need to live life to its best and its fullest. I've learned this in a way I could wish upon no one. But I pass it on to you so that you may take advantage of my lessons learned. I don't do this for fame or fortune. God knows. I don't do it to feel cured of what just breaks my heart again and again. I don't do it for monetary gain. I don't accept payment for my presentations. I do it because I believe that as a person who's been part of a historic event, it's my obligation, it is my duty to tell the story so that the 3,000 who lost their voices that day can once more be heard. And so that their spirits, so senselessly dashed that day, can once more rise and remind us that while they may have lost their lives, those lives were not lost in vain. And while I seek no payment, I do ask for payment from each and every one of you in one way and in one way only, to always remember and to never, never forget. God bless Oxford. God bless North Carolina. God bless America. Thank you.
his incredible story with us. We honor you and we applaud you. It takes an extraordinary amount of courage to relive such a traumatic event over and over again in order to educate and to shine a light on one of the darkest days in our history. Also, we applaud not only your extraordinary courage, but your willingness to be a voice for those who were lost and who have been rendered voiceless, reminding us to always remember and never forget. Thank you so much. It has been an honor to work with you. I hope this will remind you of the good people of Granville County. It absolutely will. And I now know where Granville is. We'll open up the floor for questions. Um, in order that we can get to the maximum number of people who would like to ask questions, if we could just keep it brief so we can run, uh, move it right along. Thank you. So, who's going to be the first one to break the ice? Oh, man. There you go, okay. Did you have nightmares over this? Did I have nightmares? Um, I'm fortunate. I think that uh, because I do all this talking, uh, that's my catharsis, and as a result, I've really been able to avoid any kind of scary nightmare. I've had two very vivid dreams very early on. Both were with Mary, a woman I've mentioned several times, and in both those dreams, she was in the room with me, in my bedroom with me, and looking at me and saying, it's all right, it's all right. So I don't know if that was a dream or if it was something else, but those were the only things I had that were really, really related. I'm very, very fortunate. But that's because I tell people all the time, you think I'm doing you a big favor by being here today and telling you the stories that you don't get it. You're helping me. You're helping me. Yes, sir. Do you find, do you, do you meet other survivors, you talk to them, does that help? Is that kind of a communion for you, or is there a bond there? Or? It's the weirdest thing. If you, if you know anybody that was a survivor of Vietnam, Second World War, whatever, they're all the same. And the survivors of 9-11 are the same thing. Don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Don't want to talk about it. it. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. I had seven, six other people come out with me at that meeting that day. Not one of them talks. I'm the only one. Duffy is one of them, and Duffy looked at me, and, you know, uh, he's an ape because he was not in the meeting, but he's another guy, and, and he said, you do all the talking for us, Joe. I'm not going to do it. He says, I just got to forget it. I can't think about it anymore. One of the guys that was in the meeting with me was my boss from a previous job. As a matter of fact, he had hired me twice, proof positive that he wasn't too smart. But, when I got out of the building, going home and did all the things I had to do and started to recover from this mentally. And within a week, because I lived in the Chicagoland area, Oprah reached out. And I was on the show 10 days after the event. Um, during that process and talking about the story, I mentioned that my old boss, Fred, was in the meeting with me. I got a call from him the next day, another survivor. <coughs> and he said, I'll kill you, man. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you said my name on TV. I said, do you, what are you, am I supposed to, you know, protect your copyright or what? And he said, no, no, man. He says, I didn't tell my mother I was in there. Oh, now my mother knows. And, you know, and I'm like, oh, my God. But survivors are a funny lot. It's been taken. I belong to a survivors organization based out of Chicago because that's where I was living at the time. Um, and we're getting more and more people to call and, and talk to us every day. But it's like the BFW. It's it takes a while. It just takes a while. So right now there isn't a lot of comfort in that camaraderie between survivors. Believe it or not, we get more camaraderie and more feedback from families of victims, people who lost somebody because they glom on to us survivors as, well, you are who I used to have, you know? That's it, 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 you become a replacement, so, so to speak. <coughs> but that's a great question. Sorry, I've carried on so long. Yes, ma'am? Have you been back? You oh, yeah, I've been back. I, the insurance business makes me go back, okay? Uh, there's still so many companies and whatnot that are there. Uh, it's painful every time, okay? Um, 
but I find myself walking through or around the memorial. I find the new memorial magnificent. What, what I found is even more magnificent was the construction prior to the memorial. Because to me, that was the true ground zero. That crumbled mess in the middle of New York City was true ground zero. And if you remember, they had that construction site fenced around with metal fencing. And to the outside of that metal fencing was scaffolding with wood, a lot of wood, okay? And that wood was bare. And there were people that would write on that wood with Sharpie pens. I love you, Mommy. I miss you, Daddy. Little teddy bears, little flowers. That was ground zero. And that was ground zero. But I do go back. I do walk around. I do think. I'm not going to stop. That's what they wanted me to do. They wanted me to stop. I'm not going to stop. <coughs> not ever. There was somebody back there. That's the same question. Same question. <laughs> yes, sir. I think many of us have the impression that one reason there were so many fatalities was that stairways were blocked. There was just no <coughs> way out. Did you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, if that happened, I didn't see it. And the reason that I didn't see it was let's think about where I was. I was on 105, the highest occupied level of the building. We were the last guys out. Okay? So by the time that we got down to all these levels, there all the people that had been in front of us were gone. And remember, it wasn't until the 35th floor that we encountered the cops and the firefighters coming in the other direction. So a lot of people had a head jump down those fire stairwells with really not much interference. And as I had mentioned, three, four people wide. So I think, <coughs> I think, what that happened in 93 made them realize, you got to sound the alarm quickly, you got to keep people moving, you got to keep the flow going, <coughs> and they did an unbelievable job. If you remember, right after the, the building was struck, the buildings were struck, and they started to collapse, there was conversation on TV about 10, 11, 12, 13,000 people. They didn't know. They didn't understand how many would be dead. And less than 3,000 of the trade sites. It's a miracle. An absolute miracle. Do you accept that figure? 3,000, 4,200? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we're still trying to identify some of them. Um, of the 47 people that didn't survive our meeting, only 36 have been identified. And they're still combing through the remains that are left in the mausoleum now at the New Museum every day and doing DNA testing so that they hopefully can sort of, uh, you know, find others that can. Because for the people that haven't had that, there's no closure. They're still waiting for the work. It's pretty incredible. So you still want to ask? Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> I admire your courage. And from your discussion, I'm amazed that the amount uh, or lack of amount of panic that happened coming down the stairs. That's amazing. Here's what I can say to that. Because you're right. What do you mean? My father-in-law just passed last November. Saved four men in a field where he battled a bolt. He didn't get scared. He did what he had to do. And that's what I saw that day. I saw people just doing what they had to do. You don't think about it in those moments. You know what I mean? It, it just gets to a point where you say, all right, I'm getting the hell out of here. That's really what your mind is saying to you, you know? And you think to yourself, okay, what's going to stop me? There's nothing going to stop me. I'm going to get through this. Look, that person over there needs help. Hey, come here. I'm going to help you. Let me hold your hand. Let me hold your arm. You know, it looks like you're struggling. Hey, just you're, you're crying. Hey, don't cry. We're going to make it. We're going to be okay. This was what was going on. There was no time to panic. We're busy. That's a great. It's a great point. We didn't see it, but we were very lucky. We didn't see it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I always love when somebody asks the question because it's one of my favorite stories. Okay. Did Duffy's wife, who was on the 40th floor of the North Tower, survive? Yes. Okay. To make a long story short, yes. But the story is the best part. Duffy lives on the Upper West Side. He has this condo. And he said, whenever we're there together, the door is never locked. 
He gets back to the condo. The door is locked. He's now he's panicking. He's thinking, "Oh, Michelle didn't make it back." He said, "I was afraid." He even put the key in the door and it's like shaking. He opened the door. I push it back an inch. I look through. He goes, looks through the great room, sees into the kitchen, and there is Michelle. And what happens after that is like the greatest chick flick moment ever. Okay? <laughs> she comes running from the kitchen. He comes running from the door. They meet in the middle of the floor. They're crying and they're hugging and they fall to the floor and they're crying and hugging and hugging and crying and kissing. And she pushes him back right in the middle of them and says, where the hell have you been? And he said, see, husbands are never, ever right. We're always wrong. Whatever we do. <laughs> It was a great moment. It was a great moment. Now, unfortunately, Michelle and Duffy are no longer married. Okay, but it wasn't 9/11 that broke them up. There, they have other things. Okay, but Duffy has henceforth remarried, has two children, and I'm real happy for him because he needed that. He needed that. He needed a change in his life, and he got it. So, good for him. One more question. Dun 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 dun. Let's go all the way to the back. Yes. That's a really, I don't even have to repeat her question. She, I must have got my ability to talk from that woman in the back. That's good. Um, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I did my first presentation almost exactly a year after the day. Okay. Um, the high school that my youngest daughter had just graduated from in May of 2002 at that point, okay, uh, the principal asked, would you come and give a speech on a Friday afternoon in front of 3,500 kids in a gym before Friday, okay? And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. And so this was my first taste of true Southern Baptist. This is honest to God's truth. Because here I am in Aurora, Illinois, and I'm talking to this group. You can hear Pinto. It was incredible. 3,500 kids just gravitated to this thing. And during the speech, I said at that point, I don't know what God has got in mind for me <coughs> to allow me to have a second chance, but whatever it is, I'm going to do it. And this woman, a little Southern accent, came up to me after the speech. She was an administrator from the school. And she says, you know, honey, when you said, you don't know why God saved you. I know. And you're doing it right here. You need to continue to testify. And that's the word she used. And I thought to myself, you know what? She's right. She's right. I got the gift of God. Remember, I wouldn't be a disco DJ, okay? So, so I have that skill, I guess, if you would call it. I have that ability to do that. And when I tried to write things down, I just couldn't. It would break down every time. So I thought, you know what? I can talk about this. And like I said to you, and it's a great way to end this. You're doing me a favor. And I love all of you, each and every one of you who I'll never meet. I love all of you for being able to do that for me. And I want to say something, because I love to pick on the younger people. It's not fair, because we pick on younger people all the time, don't we? You guys, whether you want to hear it or not, it's hard for us to say. It's hard for you to hear. But you're our future. And we're dependent on you. And our generation maybe hasn't done such a good job sometimes. God, look at the news. We prove that every day. We count on you. We love you. We love you. You just need to know that. You just need to know that we do count on you and we do love you. Right? Thank you all for being here this evening. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.